Today, I'm gonna to talk you through 10 things toxic parents can say and do. And I'm gonna offer up five ways that you can respond. If you're new here and you'd like to subscribe, we would love to have you. My name is Katie Morton and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And on this channel, we talk about all things mental health, from anxiety to depression to eating disorders and much, much more. I promise you will leave here with some helpful tools and techniques to assist you or someone you love in bettering themselves and improving their mental health. Now let's jump into those 10 things. Number one is, do you know all the stuff I've done for you? or anything said to make you feel like a burden. When this is said to a child, this is done as a way to cause us as the child to feel guilt or to feel like we're a burden. And it can feel like our parents' decision to have us. I'm gonna say that again. Our parents' decision to have us, decision to have us. is somehow our fault and has caused us to be indebted to them and that debt can never be repaid. And this is really just a way for our parents to project their own dissatisfaction with their life and their choices. I mean, think about it. They made a string of decisions, whether you were even planned or not, they made a string of decisions that led to them having you and then they're gonna try to blame you for those decisions that maybe they're not happy with. And trying to blame someone who had no say in what took place is just wrong and sad. Number two, you are such a disappointment. First connection. Okay. Our first relationship with our primary caregivers, usually our mother, our father, sometimes a grandma, our aunt or uncle, but that first relationship is incredibly important and part of how we develop our sense of self. And so hearing this from a parent can be incredibly devastating. It can even make us question our own self worth and lead to things like anxiety, depression, or suicidal thoughts. Again, this is just a projection of their own dissatisfaction with their life. Number three, commenting in any way about our child's appearance. This could be that they're too tall, too skinny, too short, too fat, too whatever. And I think it's kind of obvious why this isn't okay. If we're drawing attention to any part of our child's body, that can lead to them judging that part even more harshly, leading to things like eating disorder, bad body image, thinking those things about themselves all the way into adulthood. Again, because these early relationships are so key. And it's like the lens that our parents see us through when we are really little is the lens that we tend to see ourselves through as we grow up. And as you may have guessed, this is most likely a reflection of their own dissatisfaction with their body and their own body image issues. And I cannot tell you the number of patients I've had, if you don't know, I specialize in eating disorder treatment, but the number of patients I've had whose parents either also have an eating disorder or have their own distorted image of their body. And instead of acknowledging their own issues and getting help for that, they project it onto their child. Number four, is thinking that we are an extension of them and are not our own independent and autonomous person. And this can be incredibly common when we have a parent who is a narcissist. They can see all of their children as just mere extensions of them. And they can say things like, how could you do that? You're embarrassing me. I can't believe you'd act that way. Don't you know what that looks like to me or to people who know me? They make it all about themselves not allowing you to be your own independent person disconnected from them in any way. The thought that you would wanna do things on your own, make your own decisions and be independent says to a narcissistic parent that they aren't as vital or important as they think they are. And as we know, when we scratch that surface or that fake facade that a narcissist puts up, inside they're really hurt and vulnerable. And so they tend to lash out. And so by us being autonomous and independent, we're essentially telling them, I don't really need you as much anymore. They feel threatened and can lash out. Number five is not allowing for privacy. And this can happen a lot. Parents can share things with their friends or especially now online on Facebook and stuff like that. They can share things about their children that are private or embarrassing. Like, I don't know, my daughter started her period or something that you wouldn't want everybody to know, and they do this without your consent. They could also be reading our diaries, our emails, having access to our social media. You can see how this kind of relates to number four, them seeing that you're an extension of them, but this can also be a result of a helicopter parent, a parent who thinks that if they're not involved in everything and making every decision and watching over you extremely closely, that you're doing something wrong. And so if we don't allow them to have access to everything or we ask for some privacy, a parent like this can assume that we're doing something bad. Number six, 
is when they force us to live out their dreams or follow in their footsteps. Again, this doesn't allow for independence and autonomy, which is incredibly important in our development. This type of thinking and acting doesn't involve free will. And it means that our value and their love is conditional and that it's tied directly to us doing what they want in order to fulfill their dreams. It's incredibly toxic and harmful. Number seven, withholding affection and attention as a form of punishment. When parents do this, it tells us that their love is conditional and we will only get what we need. Remember, everybody is wired for connection and love. Needing attention and affection is just a basic human need. And so if our parents withhold it, if we don't do what they want, or maybe we make a mistake and do something bad because we're human, if they withhold that as a result and that's a punishment, then we can see all love and attention in our life as something that's conditional. And this can affect our relationships going forward. This can mean that we might not tell someone that we've done something upsetting or communicate a need because we're so afraid of causing that upset and then withdrawing that love. This can lead to us being an intense people pleaser, walking on eggshells, and any number of difficulties in our future relationships. And this also just shows how inept our parents are at communication. If for any parents out there, the way to navigate issues and upsets is to communicate clearly with our children, to tell them what took place and why you're upset and what maybe the punishment is going to be, like timeouts or being grounded. Those things are all fine, but just withholding love and affection, shutting down, locking them out is never going to lead to a healthy or happy relationship. Number eight, they never apologize. Parents aren't perfect, right? We're humans too. We're gonna do things that are harmful or hurtful and maybe we didn't even think about it or realize it, but that doesn't mean the upset didn't happen. And when we do things that are hurtful to our children, we should apologize. I mean, let's say for instance, we overshare with another parent and word gets around to our child that we told people about this embarrassing thing that happened at home. Thing, something that they wanted to hold private that they didn't want other people to know about. We should apologize for that. That's an important part of a relationship. And it also demonstrates to our child that when things go wrong in relationships and when someone hurts us, that we can own up to it. We can apologize. And they, as the person wounded, should be able to accept that and have a conversation about it. By apologizing, we're teaching our children how to healthfully handle conflict and also their self-worth. Because when we apologize, we're saying to them, you're important, your feelings are valid, and I want to acknowledge that. If we pretend that they aren't and we don't apologize, our child could internalize that as, I'm not important, my feelings always come last, and nothing's ever owed to me, right? I always owe to others. And this could lead to them being a people pleaser, this could lead to them never speaking up for themselves, and all sorts of things. Number nine is when we compare our child to another child. This can be done with other children in our same grade, or this could be done to a brother or sister. Comparing one person to another person is never going to be healthy. It not only can damage our own self-esteem and awareness, right? We can think that something must be wrong with us because I'm not as athletic or intelligent as, you know, Sally over there, or I'm not as tall as Steve. And we can always be looking outwards to see how we're measuring up versus being grateful for each and everything that makes us unique and makes us ourselves. And this is incredibly damaging when we do it to siblings because what this does is it can create more competition versus camaraderie. And we really don't want that kind of unhealthy competition in our families. And number 10, I'm only doing this for your own good. This is incredibly unhealthy and shuts down any conversation or communication about what's going on. It doesn't allow us to understand or ask questions. It's like a dictatorship, right? They say what we're gonna do and we just have to do it, no questions asked. It also always assumes that the parent knows what's right and best and isn't taking into consideration anyone else's thoughts or feelings about it. All of these toxic phrases and actions say more about the parent and their lack of emotional awareness and intelligence. But that doesn't mean that we can't be upset or harmed by it. Especially when these phrases or actions start at a really young age, we just wanna be 
loved, cared for, and understood. And we can do anything in our power to try to get that. And so when these toxic phrases and actions are swirling around in our life, we can find ourselves acting in unhealthy ways in order to get those needs met. Some of the best ways for us to heal from these toxic phrases or actions Number one, therapy. Therapy can be really beneficial because it can help for us to acknowledge some of those false beliefs we formed due to these toxic messages. All 10 of the things I just mentioned can come along with some bad and false beliefs about ourselves, right? I'm too fat or ugly, or I can't be autonomous, I can't be independent, right? Therapy can help us identify those false beliefs and work to challenge them so that we can slowly but surely let go. And number two is inner child work. And that can come along in therapy or it can be something we can do on our own. Inner child work, while it sounds a little woo woo, can be incredibly beneficial. What we do in that work is acknowledge a younger us. This can be done through maybe referencing old diaries we had or looking at an old photo of ourselves and considering what was going on at that time in our life and maybe what we needed. And yes, I know this can take a lot of internal work, but Often when we're children, we just want to be cared for and understood. And so if we can offer those messages to ourselves, sometimes I have my patients write letters back and forth from a younger them to them now and vice versa. There could be a lot of ways we can attach to our younger self and work to heal some of the damage that was done by these toxic messages. And my third tip is to notice our self-talk. Because we've been told some horrible things about ourselves and our environment all throughout our upbringing, we can have a very negative view of ourselves in our world. And just noticing the things that we're saying, because let's be honest, we shit talk ourselves all day, every day. And if we don't pay attention to that, we're having that conversation constantly and we're gonna believe it, right? How many times have I told you guys, having a thought more than once is not a fact? Your thoughts aren't facts, they lie to you. Then we have to notice those lies so that we can move them into a more neutral place. I know everybody's like, think positively. Research shows that's bullshit, I'm sorry. But you can't just think positively. You have to build a bridge from negative land all the way to positivity land. You can't just jump. It doesn't work that way. So the goal here would really be, instead of allowing those messages within our head to be like, I'm not good enough or I'm not as good as someone else, right? If we have that kind of a belief, we're looking for a thought that is like, you know, I'm open to the belief that maybe I'm judging myself too harshly. Maybe, I'm open to it. I don't know if I believe it, but maybe. And it sounds small and it doesn't sound positive, I know that. But trust me when I tell you that that small shift in our thinking can change your entire belief about yourself and your perception of the world around you. Also, it's important to know that just because there are parents doesn't mean they have to be in our lives forever. Sure, it'd be great if we could have a happy, healthy relationship with our parents and that could grow over time and you know we could have like that story book ending kind of thing. But if that relationship is toxic and abusive, it's okay to not see them anymore or to limit the amount of time you spend with them or how often you talk to them. We get to decide who is in our life and who is not. And we wanna make sure that the relationships we have and cultivate are healthy and happy ones. Let's say one or all 10 of these things have been done to us or are happening to us right now. What are some things that we can say back? What are ways we can arm ourselves with language to better protect ourselves? I have a few options for you to consider. And number one is, I can sense you're upset right now, but taking it out on me isn't okay. I know this can be hard for some of us to say, but if you just read through that, you can recognize that it's not combative, it's compassionate. And it's just holding up a healthy boundary. It's not okay to take it out on me. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Number two is, I know you wish I was more like you, or insert the person that they're comparing us to, but I am my own person and I would love it if you could support that, right? We're telling them what's not okay and then we're telling them what we would really love. That's what we would want from you. Number three, I know it's hard seeing me grow up so fast. So we're hug and roll, right? I've talked about the hug and roll. We're really kind and compassionate. And we offer understanding up front, and then we roll away, right? And we offer a healthy boundary or a limit to what's okay and not okay. So I know it's hard seeing me grow up so fast and making my own choices, but it's really important that I get to practice doing things on my own, even if I make mistakes. Number four, when you share things about me without asking me first, it makes it hard for me to want to trust you with new information. Please ask me first. Simple, right? 
clear, not combative. And number five, I know you're having a hard time, but yelling at me isn't gonna make you feel any better. Now I know we're kind of making a few assumptions there, but I feel like it's important for them to recognize that they're taking it out on you. And they may not be able to recognize that, but you're again, putting in that healthy boundary of it's not okay for you to do this. And one thing I always have to remind myself and others about, we have zero control over other people. We can only control ourselves. So acting in certain ways, hoping our parent won't be toxic or do this hurtful thing again, is not healthy for us. It's better that we take action that is healthy by speaking up, by upholding boundaries, by limiting the time we talk to them, right? There are things that we can do and I encourage you, instead of trying to do things to hopefully shift their mood and action, we consider what actions we can take personally to help us feel better. I hope you found this helpful and validating. And obviously before we you know, say anything back, I want you all to consider your safety. If you aren't able to get out of that house and you're already feeling physically, sexually, or emotionally abused by a parent, it might not be the safest for you to try to speak up. We might want to instead consider how we can remove ourselves from that situation. Or maybe we spend more time at school and after school programs or put ourselves in a sport or something so that we're not at home as, as often or for as many hours in the evening, right? So please consider your safety. I hope this was helpful and validating. Feel free to share more in the comments if you think I missed one or there's something that your parent has told you over the years that you found incredibly toxic and harmful. Let us know so we can learn together and feel better. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time.